<laughs> uh, welcome back, everybody. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective, and I'm MC Owens, and this is going to be uh, the third installment of my series on visual uh, Buddhist cosmology. Um, and so if you haven't actually checked out my presentation called Escape from Samsara, which is part one, or the inconceivable realm, part two. If you haven't checked those out, there will be a little bit of a review tonight. So it's not imperative that you've watched those, but I'm hoping you have. Um, so the presentation tonight is called Oceans of Worlds, the Cosmology of Avatamsaka Buddhism. If you haven't heard of Avatamsaka Buddhism, it's okay. We're gonna start with a brief explanation of what that's all about. Um, and yeah, and we're going to get into this third most fully developed form of Buddhist cosmology. And this uh, fully formed Buddhist cosmology is coming to us from the Avatamsaka Sutra, from whence the name Avatamsaka Buddhism. That's right. This is an entire school of Buddhism, an entire tradition of Buddhism that comes out of or is based upon this one very large Mahayana Buddha Sutra called the Avatamsaka Sutra. Um, this particular school of Buddhism that is Avatamsaka Buddhism, it's not quite as prevalent in the world today as it once was. Um, and so it's a little tricky to find the remnants of Avatamsaka Buddhism in the world today. It's, it's there, but you kind of have to look for it. But this presentation tonight is not so much about Avatamsaka Buddhism or even in a way the Avatamsaka Sutra. Tonight's talk is about the cosmology, the view of the universe or the view of the world that is found in this sutra that is really, really representative of uh, fully mature Buddhism, all right? So sort of the latest, greatest of Buddhism, this is the cosmology. This Avatamsaka Sutra here is translated, the word Avatamsaka is an ornament, the ornament sutra. And actually, if you'd like to know, Avatamsaka seems to have originally referred to an earring. So it, that type of decoration, that type of ornament, all right? But what does that mean, right? Well, it helps a little bit to know that the real title of this sutra is actually the Mahavaipulya Buddha Avatamsaka Sutra which is a mouthful, and that, but that is the kind of the full official Sanskrit title of the text. We don't actually have a original Sanskrit version of this text. It doesn't, it no longer exists. And so we are left with Chinese, Korean, and Japanese versions, uh, as well as Tibetan, I should say. Uh, what you see on the screen now is an image of a Korean version of the Avatamsaka Sutra. Um, and just to go over it really quickly, so we only know of this sutra from the originally from the Chinese, where it is the the da, the maha, the great fang guang, this broad or extensive, the great extensive full Buddha Hua Yan flower ornament sutra. So the Mahavaipulya Buddha Avatamsaka Sutra, the extremely broad sutra of the flower ornament of Buddhas. I don't know if we're getting any closer to understanding the full title of this text. You should know that these long titles of sutras, you are probably familiar, they often get shrunk down or just reduced. This one gets shrunk down to simply the, the Hua Yan Jing, right? Which is translated as, sorry, the Hua Yan Jing, which is translated as the Flower Ornament Sutra. 
And in particular, you should know that the flower ornament that is being referred to here is a garland, all right? A garland of flowers that you might wear around your neck or around your head like a crown. So that's sort of the significance of this. But again, we're not really that much closer to fully understanding this sutra that's all about these adornments, flower adornments at that. And so let's dive a little deeper into the, uh, well, the origin and the history of this sutra really quickly. So like I said, this is one of, if not the largest Buddhist sutras. And in fact, all of the versions that we have are not the longest version. So I just wanted to share with you very, very quickly. So this is from a Japanese Buddhist monk named Gyun-en. Those are his dates. And he writes, speaking of the Flower Ornament Sutra, that the most expanded, largest version of this sutra is composed of gathas, lines of verse, equal in number to the number of dust particles found in 10 times 3,000 great thousand world systems, and a number of chapters equal to the number of dust particles in four world systems. <laughs> so as you can see, it's getting cosmological already. Now that's of course the most expanded version of this sutra, right? With lines of verse equal to dust particles in 10 times a billion worlds. Next, he says, is the medium length version of the sutra. This work is composed of 498,000 gathas and is in 1,200 chapters. He goes on to tell us that these two texts, the long one and the medium one, are kept in the palace of the Nagas and have not been transmitted to us here at Injambudvipa, the terrestrial realm. <laughs> the shortest version of this sutra is composed of 100 thousand gathas and is in 38 chapters. It has been transmitted to Jambudvipa, the terrestrial realm, and it has been widely propagated throughout all of India. <laughs> now remember, this is a Japanese Buddhist monk in the 13th century who is talking about this very, very large sutra. And he's saying that the these other two almost mythological versions of the sutra, we don't have them. What we have is the, a, a trace remnant of those, right? And so the Avatamsaka Sutra that we have here in Jambudvipa, here in the terrestrial realm, there is only one complete English translation of this sutra. It was done by Thomas Cleary in 1984, and he translated it from a Chinese version of a Buddhist monk named Shikshananda around that, and Shikshananda translated it around 800 AD, right? And the Thomas Cleary version, not too unlike uh, Gyonin, our Japanese monk said, he said that it was in 38 chapters, the Thomas Cleary version has 39 chapters. I'll explain that extra chapter in a moment. Just a quick history though of this sutra as it has come to us here in Jambudvipa. The Thomas Cleary version is originally published in three very large volumes. So this is just to give you a sense of how long the small, the small version is, right? The first, uh, it was first, first, first translated in from Sanskrit into Chinese in the year 420 by Buddha Bhadra. So that's like the first record of a complete translation of this sutra. And by the way, the Buddha Bhadra translation still exists. It's a little shorter actually than Shikshananda's, but. 
And then the earliest known records of this sutra anywhere in, in Jambudvipa are from uh, the mid, like about 150, 160, so the mid second century. And those are records in Chinese. And what we have are Chinese records of parts of the Avatamsaka Sutra being translated into Chinese, but not the entirety of the Sutra. That would have to wait until the year 420. So of this Chinese Sutra now, which came from India, came from the Sanskrit language, in the Avatamsaka Sutra, one of those uh, early, early Chinese translations was of chapter 26. And chapter 26 is a famous sutra all by itself called the Ten Stages Sutra or the Dasha Bhumika Sutra. And many scholars, myself included, are pretty convinced that the Ten Stages Sutra represent the oldest and maybe the original sutra that was then kind of expanded. I'm speaking, of course, here now more scholarly historically, but that's the idea. I also wanted you to know that of this giant sutra, the last chapter, chapter 39, called Entering the Dharma Dattu, or Entering the Realm of Dharmas. It's also known as the Gandavyuha Sutra or the Sutra of Inconceivable Meanings. And that is a very, very, very famous sutra all by itself, but it's considered the conclusion of this sutra. Now, that's just a very quick, very quick, very brief introduction to this sutra. But again, this isn't really about the history of the sutra and all of that. What we're interested in tonight is I'm basically going to give you a taste just a taste of chapter five, which is called the flower bank or flower treasury world. So Thomas Cleary, our English translator, calls it the flower bank world. The word bank is a treasury or something, a repository, something like that. And it's the repository of flowers. But if you actually take a look at chapter five, you realize very quickly that the flower repository world or the flower bank world is an abbreviation of a much longer, so that's the Chinese there of the, the uh, Huayan world, the flower treasury world. But it's actually in that chapter called the flower treasury adornment ocean of worlds. And it's very important, of course, the title of my talk tonight is Oceans of Worlds. And I get that term from chapter five. And the thing about this beautiful sutra is that I'm kind of, my point here tonight is definitely to talk about the cosmology of it and oceans of worlds, but I'm also using tonight as kind of a um, an introduction to the flavor of this sutra. So again, I'm not going deep into the history or the ideas, the cosmology, yes, but the deeper dharma, no. But I am going to read a little bit of this sutra for you in a while, and in many ways, I just want to get you ready to hear. Uh, not, I mean, really just a few dust particles of this sutra, if you will. Not even, you know, not more than a page, really. But the thing about it is, is that chapter five, the flower, re, re, flower repository world or the flower treasury world, it starts on page 200 of the sutra. So there's 200 pages before this that prepare you for chapter five. And so we're gonna need to do a little bit of preparation in order to get ready for chapter five, because usually you would have read those 200 pages first. So in order to get us prepared for what's about to happen, 
we need to do a quick review of our basic Buddhist cosmology. <laughs> so this is going to be our quick review of my longer original presentation on just Buddhist cosmology. Okay. And that basically is a visual presentation of what is called a world system, a loka datu. All right. And so I do this too. I, I, I'm, I'm reviewing this, not even because I don't think you know this. I have a feeling that you remember most of what I'm about to show you. But there's a way in which this all has to be very fresh on our minds. These ideas, this imagery, it all needs to be very, very present because chapter five is going to assume that we're in this frame of mind. And so just bear with me, again, if this is repetitive, through the basic formation of the world. <laughs> so world, the world begins with creation, a period of formation. And this period of formation, of course, lasts 20 eons, kalpas, vast, vast, vast amounts of time. Again, usually kalpas are translated as eons. They're so long. And it takes about 20 kalpas for the following to happen. So initially, there's a wind disk. And I needed to really remind you of this part of Buddhist cosmology, that what begins a formation of a world is a vortex of air or wind called a vayu mandala, right? This is an air or wind disk. And this air or wind disk, well, it must exist somewhere. And so what we say is, is that there is another dimension to this wind disk, which is the dimension of akasha, space. And even though in my little um, presentation here, I've put this in the form of a circle or actually a sphere, space has no form. It has no shape. It has no color. It has no discernibility, actually. But it's just that all of this has to take place somewhere. <laughs> so it takes place in space. And then upon this disk of wind, this vayu mandala, there forms a jala mandala, which is a disk of water. And then upon this disk of water, there forms a golden crust called a kanchana mandala. This is a golden crust layer. And on that golden crust layer then forms land masses. And out of those land masses arise a series of mountain ranges. And then out of the middle of those mountain ranges emerges a extremely large mountain called Mount Maru also known as Su Maru, Maru the Beautiful. This is a mountain at its base, but I want you to know that Mount Everest, the tallest mountain in the world, is but a tiny peak at the base of Mount Maru. And not only that, Mount Maru has this odd quality of coming to a peak, but then forming, getting broader and getting broader. So that's a strange form, but this is no ordinary mountain. Indeed, it is a cosmic mountain, or as some would say, an axis mundi, an axis of the world. All right. Within this world system, within this localized realm or lokadatu, there is included the sun, the moon and the stars. So I just want you to know that a world system, a lokadatu, includes what we would think of as our solar system. So it's not just our planet, it's the whole kit and caboodle of the solar system. Also, part of this um, world here, this world system is, and remember, 
We're still in the period of formation or creation. And so there is this iron ring that surrounds the golden crust. This is called the chakra bala, the ring of iron. And this ring of iron holds in the water that begins to fall as rainfall and forms the oceans. These land masses in between the oceans, there are traditionally four land masses in a Lokodatu, a northern continent, a eastern continent, a western continent, and then there's that southern continent, Jambudvipa. That's where we live. And so Jambudvipa is actually a triangular shaped continent that, well, for all intents and purposes, is what we think of, uh, of as Earth, as like the terrestrial realm. And there are special other realms that are not inhabited by humans to the north, east, and west of us. This is all part of the basic original Buddhist cosmology, including, in addition to these four continents, there is a realm of humans on this terrestrial plane, and there is a realm of animals on this terrestrial plane. In the foothills of Mount Meru and above, there are such things as upper realms or also called heavenly realms there in, that are inhabited by devas and asuras, gods and demigods. And then below the terrestrial realm, and I got to tell you, so it's below the terrestrial realm where there are the two lower realms, the realm of hell dwellers and the realm of hungry ghosts. And I represent these lower realms like this, of which there are 18 lower realms. But my presentation here isn't exactly right because these hell realms actually should be in between the terrestrial realm and that wind disk. The wind disk is always at the bottom. But just for the sake of visualization here, I've presented it as below that. Just a, a note there. And then, in addition to these lower realms, there's actually even higher realms, which are the realms of meditators. Above Mount Meru, spatially speaking, there is the first dhyana heaven, and then there are three more levels of dhyana above that. And those in its entirety, from the highest, highest abode of the meditators, all the way down to the lowest hell realm and everything in between is what constitutes one world system, one Lokadatu. That now, after that 20 kalpas of formation, enters a period of duration, which lasts 20 kalpas. And it's during those 20 kalpas that human beings are born and animals are born and died and samsara goes on and on and on and on and on until after 20 kalpas, this world system enters a period of destruction or decay that lasts 20 kalpas. <laughs> At this point, the beginning of this 20 period of decay is when these seven suns appear somehow in our world system and begin scorching our Lokadatu. And at first, these seven suns, they burn up all of the lower realms, all of the hell realms, as it were. And then it keeps going and it burns up all of the terrestrial realm. It burns up Mount Meru. It even evaporates that disk of wind, leaving only the three higher dhyana heavens. So that first dhyana also, if you're a deep meditator, but you're only in the first dhyana, you too get burned up in the great seven suns. And then this sets the world into a period of nothingness that lasts 20 kalpas. <laughs> After this period of 20 kalpas in which there is nothing, 
at all, something happens, which is this disk appears, this disk of wind, this disk of air. <laughs> and then what happens is, is that during that first 20 kalpas of creation, after the world has formed, after the, all of the mountain ranges and the, everything, those meditators that were up there in the second, third, and fourth heavenly realm, they begin to start dropping back down and inhabiting the earth, and eventually even wind up getting reborn down in the lower hell realms. And then that brings us to a period of duration, the last 20 kalpas, only to be followed by another period of destruction, creation, duration, nothingness, creation, and it's a cyclical process that goes around and around and around forever. <laughs> that is, oh yeah, Tanya, perfect timing. Uh, is this, cos the one that you just went through, was this cosmology around at the time of Buddha or is this something that like developed after like he passed? Excellent question. So this is a, what you just saw quickly, briefly, is a summary of a cosmology that predates Buddhism. It's a cosmology or a worldview that could be called an Indian worldview, a Hindu worldview, that Buddhism, being an Indian tradition, kind of inherited in that sense. Part two is where things get exclusively Buddhist in that sense. Any other questions, comments, answers, or ideas? Excellent. All right. So again, what I just did was a very quick summary of my original presentation on Buddhist cosmology. Part two here is a quick uh, summary of my second presentation, which was on something called Sahasra cosmology, the cosmology of 1000, Sahasra. So uh, I'm really very, very glad, Tanya, that you asked that question so that I could clarify that what we saw before was sort of this general worldview, again, of India. But this is the uniquely Buddhist way. And actually, what I really want to say is that this is a Mahayana Buddhist cosmology. And so as Buddhism, this tradition, this Indian tradition, sort of begins to split into different schools and sects and styles, this divide of Hinayana Mahayana, the Hinayana, the small vehicle, they preserve that original Indian cosmology where there is one Lokadatu, we all live on that one Lokadatu, and we are all experiencing the same duration period of this Lokadatu, right? Mahayana Buddhism sees things a little bit differently. So the general um, topology, the general topology of the world system is the same, meaning the ge not the geography of it per se, but the form of it. The mountain ranges, Mount Meru, the four continents, that's pretty standard still, even in Mahayana Buddhism. However, remember when I said that when those seven suns show up and it burns everything up, those meditators that are up in those three higher heavenly dhyana realms they don't get burned up. They stay in those realms. And one of the reasons why they don't get burned up when the seven suns appear is that life in the second, third, and fourth dhyana realms, from that vantage point, the world, the Lokadatu, can start to seem like a very small place. In fact, the idea is within the Mahayana Buddhist tradition is that if you're in the second, third, or fourth dhyana, you actually are not just limited to one localized realm, to one lokadatu, but those that are in the 
Abhyasvara Bhumi, right? This second dhyana and higher, they have the vantage point of seeing not just one and not just two, three, four, five, six, or seven. Those meditators that are in those higher realms, they actually exist within a realm of a thousand, a sahasra world. So their loka datu, their world system is not just one world, it is a thousand worlds. And so in this, oh, and I think I have, yes, so this is called a chula, a chula sahasra loka datu a small 1,000 localized realm, all right? And so what happens is, is that when those seven suns appear, they eventually burn up all thousand worlds. And actually what happens is, is that after a period, of seven appearances of the suns scorching the Lokadatu, after seven destructions by fire, there is a great flood that destroys the entire Chula Sahasra Lokadatu. And even those beings that were in the second Chiana, they get flooded out. <laughs> and that leaves only those in the third and fourth Dhyana. So life in the third and fourth dhyana heaven, looking down on the Chula Sahasra Lokadatu on a thousand world systems. If you're in the third dhyana heaven, even a Chula Sahasra Lokadatu, even a collection of a thousand worlds starts to look a little small. In fact, from the vantage point of the third jhana heaven, you can actually, and you do exist, not just in the localized realm of a thousand worlds, but you actually exist within a localized realm of a thousand collections of a thousand worlds. And so this thousand collections of a thousand worlds is called a Majima Sahasra Lokadatu, a medium thousand localized realm. Now, what happens is, is that after the seven suns, there's a flood. And then there's another seven suns that appear, and then there's another flood. And then there's another seven suns that appear, and then there's another flood. And then eventually, after seven floods, after seven destructions by fire, which is said, and also 49 intermittent destructions by the seven suns, everything in a Majima Sahasra Lokadatu gets wiped away by this giant wind leaving only those beings in the fourth dhyana realm. But you know, life in that fourth dhyana realm from the vantage point, even a Majima Sahasra Lokadatu, a thousand collections of a thousand worlds, even that starts to look a little small from that vantage point. And that's because if you're actually abiding in the fourth highest heavenly dhyana realm, you are actually part of a much larger localized realm, a much larger lokadatu. And in fact, from that vantage point, you can see a thousand collections of those thousand collections of a thousand worlds. So if you do the math, that's a billion worlds that are 
overseen, if you will, or looked over by those in this highest uh, heavenly realm. So this is what is called a tri sahasra mahasahasra lokadatu, a 3,000 great thousand localized realm. This is what is translated as a trichiliocosm. If you have ever seen that language in a Buddhist text, this you are looking at is a trichiliocosm, a billion worlds. At the beginning of my talk this evening, I mentioned how supposedly the largest version of the Avatamsaka Sutra is in ver in number is has a number of verses equal to the number of dust particles in a one of these in a trisahasra mahasahasra lokadatu. It's a lot of dust particles. That's a lot of lines of verse, right? So that's this introduction to what the Mahayana Buddhist tradition is talking about when they talk about a 3,000 great thousand world system or a trichiliocosm. But where I ended my second talk on cosmology is that those meditators who were in the second jhana, third jhana, and fourth jhana are still, to, a de to one degree or another, they are still subject to the conditions of that trisahasra mahasahasra lokadatu. They are still part of a world system. And that even though they have sort of transcended it a bit, they are still, in a, again, subject to the karma, subject to the karmic actions of that lokadatu. So those meditators, in those higher realms, still subject to karma in a lokadatu, which is not the case for a fully enlightened Tathagata, a fully enlightened Buddha. And the idea is, is that a fully enlightened being, a fully enlightened Buddha, from their vantage point, even a tri sahasra mahasahasra lokadatu starts to look pretty small. And in fact, what they talk about in the Mahayana Buddhist tradition is that the Buddha, a fully enlightened being, has the ability to not only transcend all lokadattus and all conditionality, but a Buddha, a fully enlightened being, can actually take a tri sahasra, maha sahasra lokadattu and place it on the tip of a hair. And this ability, this unique ability of a Buddha, a fully enlightened being, the ability of them to place onto the tip of a hair an entire billion worlds, that is something that is called the inconceivable realm. The inconceivable realm is this realm where space and time really cease to make any sense in that way. Up until this inconceivable realm, we still had pr a pretty strong grip on space and time. Even though we were talking about kalpas upon kalpas upon kalpas and world systems upon world systems upon world systems, we were still rooted in the conditions of space and time. When the Mahayana tradition starts talking about a Buddha, a fully enlightened being, being beyond conditionality, beyond space and time, that's, well, that's where you start to get this idea that they can place a billion world systems on the tip of a hair because they are beyond that conditionality. Now, is the ability to place a billion worlds on the tip of a hair just a poetic way of talking about being transcended from conditionality? Maybe. 
a beautiful way to talk about being liberated from conditionality, that's for sure. But I wouldn't want to leave it in so such logical terms in that way, right? So I just kind of want to leave you with this idea, this image of a Buddha being able to place a billion worlds on the tip of a hair as a sort of meditative contemplative exercise. What does it mean that a Buddha can place a billion worlds on the tip of a hair, right? And if you want a few more uh, insights into how to think about the inconceivable realm, please see my entire presentation on that idea. <laughs> which brings me to the subject for tonight, which is part three, oceans of worlds. So I thank you for participating in that review so that we could have all of those numbers and all of those ideas and even those visuals right fresh on our mind so that we could begin to talk about oceans of worlds. So again, what we're about to explore is the cosmology of the Avatamsaka Sutra. Yes, the Avatamsaka Sutra is a Mahayana Buddhist Sutra. And so it's full of Trisahasra, Mahasahasra, Lokadatus. They're everywhere in that. In other words, this sutra, the Avatamsaka Sutra, it assumes you know all about this cosmology. And in fact, it's hoping that you know all about this cosmology so that it can have a little fun. <laughs> and so, like I said earlier, my, my goal here tonight is to actually read to you a little bit from the Avatamsaka Sutra. And I guess I could say, I could tell you that I tried, I tried to create a PowerPoint presentation of Oceans of Worlds, but it gets a little hard, right? But the idea here is, is this, if you were to pick up a copy of the Avatamsaka Sutra and you were to start reading it, you would be introduced to the idea of not just one Trisahasra Mahasrasa Lokadatu and not just two Trisahasra Mahasrasa Lokadatus, three, four, or five Trisahasra Mahasrasa Lokadatus. No. <laughs> The Avatamsaka Sutra is talking about oceans upon oceans of world, of not just world systems, oceans of Trisahasra Mahasahasra Lokadatus. So I've done my best here to create something of a visual of this idea of oceans of worlds. All right. There's a little bit more to come on the visual front, so pay attention. But in general, what I want to do is start drifting towards this reading of part of chapter five of the Avatamsaka Sutra. There's just a few things more that you need to know going into this. The Avatamsaka Sutra is a curious sutra for a number of reasons the cosmology really only being a small part of it. So what I need to tell you before I can read this is, first of all, reading the Avatamsaka Sutra is an experience. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, is that the Avatamsaka Sutra, it's not like, it's definitely not like one of those old, Pali uh, Buddhist suttas. And what I mean is, is that the original collection of Buddhist suttas, they have information to tell you. <laughs> and the point of the sutra is to deliver information to you. Maybe it's information about the Four Noble Truths and, and clinging leading to suffering and not clinging leading to enlightenment and liberation. 
or maybe it's about skandhas, aggregates of the self, any number of things. But those early suttas were delivering information. The Avatamsaka Sutra, it yes, it has dharma, it has information, but what makes it such a special sutra is that the only way, the only way to understand it is to read it or to listen to it being read. And that's because it's, it's kind of like if, if I wanted to tell you what happens in chapter five, the only way I could do it is to read it. <laughs> there is no summary. There is no abridgment. It, it, again, it is the act of visualizing, the act of reading that is the information. So the only way to do it is to actually read it or have it um, or listen to it in that way. So that's why I say that it's an experience. Part of this beautiful experience that is the Avatamsaka Sutra, and this is just a few more bits that I have to tell you so that you can appreciate what I'm about to read. This sutra is very much about the Bodhisattva path, the path of the enlightenment seeker, the Bodhisattva, who is on their way through those aforementioned 10 stages of development, moving from being a bodhisattva to a buddha. So from a seeker of awakening to an awakened one. So remember, buddha is an awakened one. A bodhisattva is one seeking that very awakening. Now, the Avatamsaka Sutra, like any good Mahayana Buddhist Sutra, is chock full of bodhisattvas. There's bodhisattvas popping out of every corner of this sutra. But there's one bodhisattva who is, in a way, the most important. And this bodhisattva is named Samantabhadra. And what I'm going to read to you in a moment is from the, the words of Samantabhadra Bodhisattva, not the words of Siddhartha Gautama, the historical Buddha, not the Buddha that gave us the Pali Suttas. This is actually these sort of, again, words of this Bodhisattva. But Samantabhadra is no ordinary Bodhisattva. Samantabhadra is kind of considered the original Bodhisattva. The, the Ur, Ur Bodhisattva. In a sense, if you're kind of into uh, Jung, Jungian archetypes, Samantabhadra is the archetypal Bodhisattva, of which all other Bodhisattvas are sort of resemblances of this primordial, original in, seeker of enlightenment. So it's important to know that about Samantabhadra, that he's not just an ordinary bodhisattva. The other figure that you just need to know because it gets mentioned just a few times is that the, the Avatamsaka Sutra has this, um, well, I could put it to you this way. In the same way that the Avatamsaka Sutra has this archetypal, original bodhisattva, and then all a bunch, a bunch, a bunch, a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of other bodhisattvas. In that same way, this sutra tells us about the original archetypal Ur Buddha, whose name is Vairochana, the great illuminator, also known as the great Sun Buddha, S-U-N, Sun Buddha. So Vairochana sort of, he appears in this sutra in a very strange way, all right? And that's again, because it's not a normal Buddha. It's kind of an archetypal Buddha. That's kind of a complement to this archetypal Bodhisattva. And so there's sort of a, a 
a meta discourse going on in this sutra, which is about Samanta Bhadra's pursuit of enlightenment. And then there's sort of the normal level at which this sutra is taking place, which is the, the actual words and ideas that are being presented. So I mentioned that so that when these names pop up, you'll have a sense of what's being described. All right. Um, again, that's sort of the basics. I'm going, you know, encourage you, I have a few slides, a few suggestive slides to go along with this. So every now and then maybe uh, just check out the screen, but otherwise I am going to read. I'm reading from the beginning of chapter five, and I'm reading from the end of chapter five. So I'm gonna read to you a little bit of an introduction, and then I'm gonna read to you a little bit from a poem that appears at the end of this chapter. The Avatamsaka Sutra, like most Mahayana Buddhist sutras, has both prose and poetry. And the way that this sutra uh, reads is the way that the Lotus Sutra reads. It's the way that many, many Mahayana sutras read, which is that there's a prose section followed by a summary of the prose in poetic verse. So the sutra goes back and forth between prose and poetry. If you're used to this, if you're familiar with this, if you've noticed this about Mahayana Buddha Sutras, I would really just wanna take this opportunity to, to say, contrary to what many people say, the poetry section is not just repeating the prose section. The poetry section actually clarifies and explains the prose so it's vitally important to read them both. I'm not going to read them both, although I am going to read from a prose section and a poetry section to give you the flavor of both of those. But if, if I started really reading this sutra word for word, we'd be here for three weeks. So I don't have three weeks tonight, to, to do that, so we're gonna do it in this shorter version. Okay, so on that note, perfect timing. And before I dive in, any questions, comments, answers, or ideas to increase full enjoyment of this? Excellent. Let me get some, some lu lubrication. Okay. So again, I just want to remind you, I'm reading from the very, very beginning, or straight from the very, very first line, but it's of chapter five. So what I mean to say is, is that in chapter five, or I should say in chapter four, in chapter three, in chapter two, we've already been introduced to this ocean of worlds. So what I, what I mean to say briefly is that right before this chapter or in the chapters before this, world systems start coming at us. Tri Sahasra, Maha Sahasra, Lokadatu start coming at us until pretty soon we're swimming in Tri Sahasra, Maha Sahasra, Lokadatus. That's how this sutra, it's how it rolls, right? It's how it, lays it out. And so then at that point, we arrive at chapter five. And then, ah, too much going on. All right. And then the Bodhisattva, Samanta Bhadra, again, addressed the great assembly saying, O oh, children of the Buddha, this flower treasury adornment, ocean of worlds, was adorned and purified 
by the great illuminator Vairochana in the remote past by cultivating enlightening practices for as many kalpas as dust particles in an ocean of worlds. In each of those kalpas, he associated with as many buddhas as there are particles of dust in an ocean of worlds. In the presence of each of those buddhas, purely practicing great vows, as numerous as dust particles in an ocean of worlds. Children of the Buddha, this flower treasury adorn, or sorry, flower treasury adornment, ocean of worlds, is supported by as many wind disks as there are particles of dust in a Meru mountain. The bottom most wind disk is called Upeksha, equanimity. It holds adornments of blazing flames of jewels above it. The next wind disk above that is called producing various jeweled adornments. It holds banners of wish-fulfilling jewels radiant with pure light above it. The next higher wind disk is called jeweled virtue. It holds jeweled chimes above it. The next higher wind disk is called Upekshik or equanimous flame. It holds wish fulfilling, wish fulfilling wheels above it. The next higher wind disk is called various universal adornments. It holds luminous floral wheels above it. The next higher wind disk is called universal purity. It holds flaming lion thrones entirely made of flowers above it. The next higher wind disk is called the sound pervading the 10 directions. It holds banners entirely made of royal pearls above it. The next higher wind disk is called all jeweled light. It holds every wish fulfilling jewel, tree covered flowers above it. The next higher wind disc is called universal support. It holds fragrant clouds of wish fulfilling jewels that are like Meru mountains. And the next higher wind disc is called Various Mansions in Motion. It holds clouds of pedestals of all precious colors and fragrances above it. Children of the Buddha, the uppermost wind disc as as numerous as dust particles in a Muru mountain is called treasury of supreme light. It holds an ocean of fragrant water adorned by radiant wish-fulfilling jewels. In this ocean of fragrant water, is an enormous lotus blossom called Banner of Fragrance with pistols of all kinds of light radiating everywhere. This flower treasury adornment ocean of worlds rests therein. All right, that is the conclusion of the opening 
of chapter five that tells us the location of the flower adornment treasury ocean of worlds. And again, that was just a taste of how the Avatamsaka Sutra reads. It becomes sort of difficult to hold in mind exactly where and what is happening. And that makes reading or even listening to the Avatamsaka Sutra a concentration exercise that to actually try to hold these images in mind and to actually try to like hold them all in mind so that you have a visualization of where we are is very difficult. But again, it's why I call the Avatamsaka Sutra an experience in that way. So what follows after this is actually a poem that describes those 10 wind disks, but in different terms to clarify some things about them. Then we are told by Samantabhadra about these vast mountain ranges that are at the edges of this treasury ad flower adornment ocean of worlds. Then we are told all about, well, actually I can't even begin to describe it because what happens is, is that the sutra takes us deep inside this ocean of worlds and begins to describe, and if you remember, this ocean of worlds is perched on a lotus flower. It begins to describe ocean, or not oceans of worlds, but it begins to describe worlds inside this ocean of worlds where there are lotus flowers with worlds on them. <laughs> In other words, the sutra starts to get rather psychedelic if it hasn't been psychedelic already in that way. And it just proceeds to get crazier and crazier and crazier until you're being led through this visualization of world systems perched on lotus flowers, perched on fragrant seas of water, perched on jewels, perched on, it just goes on and on and on. So that's a, a little flavor, a little taste of the Avatamsaka Sutra and a little cosmic orientation of where this flower treasury adornment ocean of worlds resides. Now, before it gets too late, now I'm going to read a brief part of the concluding poem of chapter five. This is a very long poem. Um, it's the longest of the whole chapter. I will not read it in its entirety. But in many ways, the cosmology of Avatamsaka Buddhism is in this poem. And I hope that you can hear it. I hope that I can do it justice in that way. And I hope I've given you all the requisite information that you would need to appreciate it. So after all of this journeying through all of these world systems upon world systems upon world systems, then to state his meaning again, the Bodhisattva Samantabhadra, receiving power from the Buddha, said in verse, this flower treasury ocean of worlds is equal to the realm of dharmas, the Dharma Dhatu. Its adornments are all extremely pure, resting peacefully in space. In this ocean of worlds are inconceivably many world systems, each one independent, not all mixed up. 
in this flower treasury, world of world ocean, the world systems are all well arrayed with different shapes and adornments. They all vary in characteristics. The sounds of Buddha's miraculous displays are the substance of some of these systems. Seeing according to the power of karma, the world systems are all finely adorned. Sumeru, mountain city networks, circular shapes of whirlpools, immense lotus flowers blooming, they all circle one another. Mountain banner palace shapes, whirling vajra shapes, like this are the inconceivable vast systems of worlds. Flames of pearls from the ocean, inconceivable nets of lights, the world systems are all like this, all resting on lotus blossoms. The webs of light of each world system cannot be fully described. Inside the lights appear all the lands, throughout the seas of all ten directions. Into the ornaments, adorning all the systems of worlds, enter all the lands, making everything visible everywhere. The world systems are inconceivable. The worlds are boundless. Their various fine embellishments all derive from the power of the great sage. In each of these systems of worlds, the worlds are inconceivably many. Some forming, some decaying, some have already crumbled to nothingness. Like leaves in a forest, some growing, some falling. So too, in these world systems, do worlds form and decay. Just like according to the forest, the various fruits are all different. In these world systems as well, do various beings live. Just as when seeds are different, so are the fruits that they produce. Because of the differences in the force of karmic acts, living beings' lands are not all the same. Just as the Mani Ratna Raja, the king of wish-fulfilling jewels, just as the king of wish-fulfilling jewels appears a different color for everyone, when beings' minds are pure, they can see pure lands. Just like great Naga kings creating clouds, filling the sky, so does the power of the Buddha's vow produce various lands. Just as a magician's arts can make various things appear due to the force of being's karmic actions, the number of realms is inconceivable. Just like pictures drawn by an artist, so too are all worlds made by the mind painter. Beings' bodies differ. They arise from the mind of discrimination. Thus are all the lands varied, all depending upon karmic action. Just as the guide is seen in various different forms, so do beings see their lands according to 
their mental patterns. The borders of all worlds are draped with lotus nets. Their various features each different, their adornments all pure. In those lotus nets rest networks of lands with various adornments inhabited by various beings. Some lands are dangerous and uneven. Because of beings' afflictions, they are all seen this way. Innumerable kinds of worlds, defiled as well as pure, they all develop according to beings' minds, maintained by the power of bodhisattvas. In some lands is purity as well as defilement. This arises from the force of karmic actions produced under the influence of bodhisattvas. Some lands are made of pure jewels. Some radiate light. Some with various fine adornments purified by all Buddhas. In each world system of lands are culpic fires, inconceivable many. While it appears disastrous, all places remain secure. By the force of beings karmic actions are many lands produced, supported by wind disks or resting on spheres of water. The dharmas, the phenomena of these worlds, are thus variously seen, yet they really have no origination, and they also have no disintegration. In each moment of mind are infinite lands produced. By the spiritual power of the Buddha, all are seen as pure. Okay. A taste of the Avatamsaka Sutra. That was amazing. I'm so glad to hear. <laughs> because it's kind of was the whole point of the, everything leading up to it. So if that wasn't good. <laughs> okay, we have a, a lovely little, thank you, thank you, a lovely 15 minutes or so to chat, questions, comments, answers, ideas about the oceans of worlds. What psychedelics were they on? <laughs> it's like, no, uh, I, I think it's yeah, called I, Diana I and Samadhi. <laughs> Right. I was just going to say, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but, and I know people get there from meditating, but wow, it's just like, that was incredible. Oh yeah. And I, you know, I, I, my, my goal in life, I think is to like turn people on to the Avatamsaka Sutra, because I think it's so beautiful. It's so wonderful. It just takes a little getting used to in that way where you have to stop looking for the answers and sort of just allow it but i feel like and you tell me i feel like that last poem made the cosmology pretty clear like what are these billions and billions of worlds right 